A woman bails out of an airplane at an altitude of 10,000 feet. She falls freely for 20 seconds, and then after 20 seconds, she opens her parachute. How long will it take her to reach the ground? Here we're going to assume linear air resistance, rho times velocity, feet per second, squared. And whenever she's not have the parachute, it's rho is 0.15. And then once the parachute is being used, rho is 1.5. As we're thinking about this problem, we really need to break it into two separate cases. The first case is whenever she jumps out of the airplane and free falls for 20 seconds. The reason we need to separate these two cases is one, we have different um, air resistance. It is lower before she opens the parachute and then it's higher after. And then additionally, we have different ideas for what is the initial velocity and what is the initial position. So for the first 20 seconds, we know that the initial position was 10,000 feet because that was the altitude of the plane. And since she's just jumping out of the airplane, her initial velocity is zero. Now, after she's been falling for 20 seconds, we know that she'll have a new height we don't know the initial position for the remaining part, and she'll have some initial velocity. And the way that we'll find these two quantities is through working through our first case, because we know that the initial height and the initial velocity for with the parachute is exactly in the last 20 seconds. So what's happening? What's the velocity at 20 seconds? What's the position at 20 seconds? So if we can understand how this is working, and then we plug in 20 seconds, we'll get these two quantities. So let's focus on the first 20 seconds. How is the skydiver's velocity changing with respect to time in our first 20 seconds? We know velocity changes with respect to time at minus the resistance times the velocity minus our gravity. Now, all of our units here are in terms of feet, so we'll use our gravity as 32. And at this point in time, since we're in the first 20 seconds, that's our value for rho. So we have minus 0 0.15 velocity. And that's how velocity is changing with respect to time. And now we have a differential equation that we can work with. Specifically, I'm going to add the 0.15 V to both sides. And we'll get dV dt plus 0 0.15 v, and I need to write that as negative 32, is equal to negative 32, and we see that we have a linear first order differential equation, so we can use our integrating factor method. Here, this is our term that's getting multiplied by our function v, so my integrating factor, normally, oftentimes that's labeled as rho, but we don't want to confuse it here, so I'm just going to say I for the integrating factor is e to the integral 0 0.15 with respect to time, e to the 0, 1.5 t. Multiply that across both sides of the equation, and we get And now as we think about integrating both sides with respect to t, we see the left side is just the result of the product rule for derivatives with respect to t of the original product e to the 0.15 t times v. So as we integrate it, we get right back to that product. And then we can integrate the left side with respect to t as well. We'll get negative 32 over 0 0.15 e to the 0 0.15 t plus some constant of integration, let's call that a. Now negative 32 divided by 0 0.15, that will give us negative 213 with three repeating. And we'll have our velocity equation if we can just divide both sides by this e to the 0 0.15 t term. So as we divide both sides by this term, it cancels here perfectly. It will cancel out of this term, and we'll end up with a 
over e to the 0.15t, but of course that could be rewritten as a times e to the negative 0.15t. So let's rewrite it and solve for v. And using our initial velocity being zero, we can solve for what this constant a should be. So whenever we input time is zero here, our velocity should end up being zero. So we have zero equals negative 213.3 repeating plus a. And now e to the zero is just one, so a is getting multiplied by one. So we can see here that a has to be positive 213.1.3 repeating. And we can replace that in our expression and find our velocity equation to be. So we have our velocity equation. And this will help us because we know that after 20 seconds, that's whenever we release the parachute and we kind of restart our problem with a new initial velocity and a new initial height. So since we know after 20 seconds, we can just plug 20 seconds in for t and that will get us our new initial velocity that we'll use for the second part of our problem. So let's type that into our calculator. times 20 seconds. And whenever I calculated that, I got negative 202.712 feet per second. So we'll replace that. That's our initial velocity once we start using the parachute. Oh, and we need to replace that here. So we have our initial velocity in order to find our initial position, we need to take our velocity equation and integrate it again with respect to time, and that will get us back to our position equation. Let's turn the page and do so. So as we integrate with respect to time, we will get our height, negative 213.3 repeating times time, our variable t, plus, now as we integrate this, we know that the constant stays the same we divide by negative 0 0.15. We have our e to the same expression. And then there's a constant of integration. We already used a, so now let's call this b. And in order to determine what this constant of integration is, we go back to one of our known ideas was that the initial height was 10,000 when time was 0. So when we input zero in for time, the first two terms disappear. Or not disappear, the first term disappears. This term goes to one and we end up having 10,000 equals negative 14 to 2.2 repeating times one, e to the zero is one, plus our term b. We can solve this and get that b should be equal to 11,422.2 repeating. So now we have our equation that tells us the height at any moment t for the first 20 seconds. And we were interested particularly in knowing the height after 20 seconds because we know that's going to be our new initial height whenever we release the parachute and we do our calculations again. So let's substitute 20 seconds in for t and calculate that and we find that the height after 20 seconds is. So after 20 seconds we are now 7,084.75 feet above the ground. So now that we found the velocity at 20 seconds and the height of the parachuter after 20 seconds we can similarly find the new change in velocity over time with the new air resistance and our new initial height and initial velocity. Then from that, we're going to get the equation for velocity. And then from that, we're going to get the equation for height. And we'll be able to determine how long it took the parachuter to reach the ground. So we're going to follow a similar idea here, except now, due to the parachute, our air resistance has increased and it's 
going to be starting with the equation dv dt is negative 1.5 velocity minus 32. So on our new page, let's start over with this equation. Now this one is similar as before. We add the 1.5 v to both sides and we end up with dv dt equals, or sorry, plus 1.5 equals our negative 32. This is a linear first order differential equation. We can use the integrating method factor and we find our integrating factor to be e to the integral of this, which will just give us 1.5t. We're gonna multiply that to both sides and the left side becomes We see the left side is just a perfect result of product rule, so when we integrate both sides with respect to t, we're going to kind of undo that product rule when we get back to the original product. And then as we integrate this, we know it's going to be our coefficient divided by the 1.5 e to the 1.5 t, plus now a new constant of integration since we're integrated with respect to t. We already used a and b, so let's say c. So this coefficient simplifies to be negative 21.3 repeating. And then let's divide both sides by this term. It will cancel here, cancel here, and we'll divide it here, but we know we could just rewrite it as that to the negative exponent. So dividing all terms by the e to the 1.5t gives us the velocity equals negative 21.3 repeating plus c times e to the negative 1.5 t. Now we know the initial velocity once we opened the parachute was negative 202.712. So we can just plug that into our equation and we'll be able to solve for this constant of integration. Okay, e to the zero is just one that multiplies by one. We can solve this and we see our constant of integration should be. So this is our velocity equation after we open the parachute. So we can integrate this one more time and we'll get our position equation that shows the position of the parachuter with respect to time. So let's turn the page and we'll integrate this. So here we get the height of the parachuter is negative 21.3 repeating t minus 181.3786 repeating divided by our negative 1.5 e to the negative 1.5 t plus a constant of integration, let's call this d. And recalling back, we know whenever we open the parachute, our initial height was here. So we can plug in zero for t let this be equal to our height and we'll solve for our constant d. Our first term goes to zero. Multiplied by one, e to the zero is one. Plus our term t, we can solve and get that d must be equal to. And this equation will give us the height of the parachuter at any time t. And specifically, we want to know how long will it take for the parachuter to reach the ground. We know when the parachuter reaches the ground, the height is equal to zero. So we can set the equation that we just found equal to zero and then solve for t and we'll know how many seconds it takes for the parachuter to go from where they were after the first 20 seconds of the fall until they hit the ground. So let's set this equal to zero, and then using our calculators, we can solve for the value of t that makes this equation equal to zero. And we'll find that that happens when t is equal to 326.476 seconds. But we need to remember that there was also the initial 20 seconds of fall without the parachute. So that would give us a total of 346.476 seconds. So 
perhaps that was a lengthy problem, but if you look back at our work, we did basically the same process just twice under slightly different air resistance and then a different initial velocity and initial height. Now in our next problem, we have that it is proposed to dispose of nuclear waste in drums with weight W equal to 640 pounds and a volume of 8 cubic feet. By dropping them in the ocean, here we want to note this with an initial velocity of 0, the force equation for a drum falling through the water is given here. So this is nice, we have this. The mass times the change in velocity with respect to time equals negative w plus b plus f sub r. Where we have the buoyant force b is equal to the weight of the volume of the water displaced by the drum. Okay, and the weight of the water is 6.5 pounds per each cubic foot, but we know that the drums are 8 cubic feet, so we're going to combine that together in a second. And F sub R is the force of the water resistance, which is 1 pound for each foot per second of the velocity of the drum. If the drums are likely to burst upon an impact of more than 75 feet per second, so we're interested in when velocity is less than or equal to 75 feet per second. What is the maximum depth to which they can be dropped in the ocean without the likelihood of bursting? So let's label a few things that we know off to the side and maybe some things that we're looking for. First off, let's talk about the mass. We know in general the mass is equal to our force divided by the acceleration now here the force is the weight of the drum, which is 640. And everything listed here is in terms of feet, so we're going to do our acceleration is 32, as in 32, the acceleration of gravity. And this is 20. Okay. Now we know our weight. We were told the weight is 640. The buoyancy... is equal to the weight of the water that is displaced by the drum. Now the water is 62.5 pounds for every cubic feet of water displaced, but we know there is 8 cubic feet in a drum. So the buoyancy can be found by taking the 8 cubic feet and multiplying it by 62.5, and that will give us a buoyancy of 500. Next up, let's look at our F sub r. It tells us it is the force of the water resistance that is one pound for each foot per second of the velocity of the drum, which translates to negative times the velocity. So combining this all into our given equation, we find that 20 times dv dt equals negative 640 plus 500 minus V. Now these two can combine and they'll be negative 140 when we simplify. And this is our differential equation that we can work with. Dividing both sides by 20, we get the simplified expression dv dt equals negative 7 minus 1 over 20 times our velocity, and that will simplify to a negative 0 0.05. If we add our negative 0 0.05 v term to both sides, we see we have another first order linear differential equation And if we follow the correct procedure, we'll have no problem finding the equation for just our velocity. So our integrating factor is e raised to the integral of the coefficient here, 0 0.05. Integrate with respect to t, we'll get this term. Multiply this through the left and the right, and we'll find. And if we integrate both sides with respect to t, we see that as we integrate the result of this product rule, it goes back to the original product. 
integrating the left side. plus our constant of integration, let's call that A. Now let's divide both sides by this term to get V by itself. As we do so, we see it cancels perfectly here, and then it could be rewritten as a negative exponent multiplied by the A. And this is our equation for the velocity of the drum. Now recall that we were told the initial velocity was zero. So we can use that information to solve for this constant a. Plugging in zero in for time and zero in for our velocity, we get the equation zero equals negative 140 plus a times one, because e to the zero is one. We see that a has to be positive 140. So that means our velocity equation is this. Now let's go back and review what our goal is. We now have the equation for velocity. If we wanted to, we could integrate it again and get the equation for height. It would just take a bit of time. But our goal is to know what's the depth. So that is a height or depth. So we do need to integrate again to get the depth equation. What's the depth that they could be safely dropped? But remember, to be safely dropped means the velocity needs to be less than 75 feet per second. So let's first use our velocity equation, set it equal to 75, the maximum allowed velocity, and see how much time our drum could drop through the ocean before it passes that velocity. Then once we know that time period, if we have an equation for the depth, we could plug that time into the depth and see what's the safe resting depth for the drum to fall into the ocean. And one very important correction we need to make here is our velocity is negative because our drum is going downwards. So we're looking for whenever the velocity is greater than negative 75 feet per second or less negative. So setting our velocity equation equal to negative 75, we'll first add 140 to both sides and we get 65 equals 140 e to the negative 0.05 t, divide both sides by 140. Natural log of both sides. Natural log of this will just give us back our input since natural log and e are inverse functions. So we can say t is exactly equal to natural log of 65 over 140 all divided by negative 0.05, and that'll give us 15.345 seconds. Now that we know the time that results in this maximum allowed velocity, if we can find an equation for the depth of the drum by integrating velocity with respect to time one more time, then we can know what is the safe depth that the drum can go. So let's integrate our velocity again with respect to time. We get negative 140 t plus 140 divided by negative 0.05 e to the negative 0.05 t plus our new constant of integration. Let's call that b. And then whenever we initially dropped the drum, it was at the ocean level or height zero and the depth is going down as the drum goes down into the ocean. So we know our initial height was zero. Setting that up, we can solve zero equals zero plus, let's simplify what is 140 divided by this. That's minus 2800. Whenever we simplify that, e to the zero is one, so times one plus b. So that tells us our coefficient for b needs to be positive 2800. So our equation for the depth is negative 140 t minus 2800 plus 2800. And now we know that at this many seconds, we hit our maximum allowed velocity. So if we substitute that in for t, we'll get the maximum depth because if the drum was allowed to go any farther, 
the velocity would get larger and get past the safe amount. So let's substitute in this value for t, and we'll get our maximum allowed depth. Typing this into the calculator, we get the maximum allowed depth is negative 6, 100, 400, negative 6, 148.3 feet. An arrow starts straight upward from the ground with an initial velocity of 100 feet per second. It experiences both deceleration of gravity and deceleration of v squared divided by 800 due to air resistance. How high does it go? So let's just chart out the arrow's path as a rough sketch. It says we started at the ground, so that tells us our initial height was zero. And we were told the initial velocity is 160 feet per second. So at first the arrow rises. And at some point, its velocity reaches zero and it starts to fall. And the key thing that we know about this highest point is it is when the velocity equals zero. Before velocity was positive, it started at the highest point of 160 feet per second. And due to deceleration from gravity and air resistance, this velocity eventually gets to zero, at which point the arrow is now pulled down and its velocity is negative until it hits the ground. So when the problem asks us how high in the air does the arrow go, we know we can solve that to find when is velocity equal to zero, that will give us a time period, and then we can plug that time period into our height equation which we can get by integrating velocity again. So we're kind of charting out our path here. We need to create a differential equation that we can then solve for v, that we can then integrate again for height, and we can plug in the correct time period. So the change in our velocity with respect to time will be due to the deceleration from gravity and the air resistance. We know that since everything's written in terms of feet, we're working with negative 32 minus what's happening with respect to air resistance. Now, as we think about how we can solve this differential equation, if we're a little tricky here, we can set up a nice known integral. The first thing I'd like us to note is we've got a negative on both terms. So let's just factor out that negative. And now if we divide both sides by this term, we're going to get the expression 1 over 32 plus 1 over 800 v squared dv dt equals negative 1. Now at first glance this might not look very helpful, but remember the nice known integral that 1 over 1 plus u squared du is just inverse tangent of u. So if we could somehow force there to be a 1 here, whatever this is being squared, we have our du here, then we can integrate the left side nicely. So let's turn the page and work on manipulating the left side to look like this nice known integral. First things first, let's factor out a 32 from the bottom, and we get 1 over 32 times 1 over 800. And then we took out of this 1 800, we divided it by 32. And then one thing that we're going to check, 800 times 32 is
25,600. And then if we take the square root of that, it's perfectly 160. So this coefficient here becomes, and let's also at the same time multiply both sides by 32 to cancel it from the bottom. I had already done that there mentally, but let's make it right. And we get 1 over 1 plus 1 over 160 squared v squared dv dt equals negative 32. Now, particularly here, I think we'll benefit from seeing this as 1 over 160 times v all squared. And we know that this will work out if this is kind of our u, then our du needs to be 1 over 160 dv. We need a 1 over 160 in this term. So if I'd like there to be a 1 over 160 here, what I do to the left side, I have to do the right side. And negative 32 divided by 160 is negative 0 0.2. So now we've made this in the exact right form. We know if we integrate both sides with respect to t, we'll get inverse tangent of r something squared equals negative 0 0.2 t plus our constant of integration. Now we can compose the left and right sides with tangent. That will be a composition of inverse functions on the left side, which will get us 1 over 160 times the velocity equals tangent of negative 0 0.2 t plus a. And before we get too far along with this, we might want to go back here and solve for what a would be equal to. If we go back to the problem, we were told the initial velocity is 160. So whenever we input that into our equation, we get tangent, inverse tangent of 160 over 160 is 1 equals negative 0.2 times 0, 0 plus a. So a is equal to whenever inverse tangent is equal to 1, referring to our unit circle, that's at pi over 4. So I could rewrite this as over pi over 4 for our a. And our velocity, multiply both sides by 160. Now the point of the problem was to find how high did the arrow go. And we know that we can kind of chart that out at the height of the arrow's progress, velocity equals zero. So we could set this up, solve for t, and that gives us how much time it takes for the arrow to reach its peak. However, in order to finish the problem, we need to know the height of the arrow over time, which will involve integrating this again with respect to time. Now, as we want to find a function that gives us the height of the arrow over time, We'll want to integrate velocity because the integral of velocity is position. And to do so, we need to know how to integrate tangent. So remember, the integral of tangent of u with respect to u is natural log absolute value of secant of u plus c. So with a quick u substitution, we'll be able to integrate this. Let's let our u be equal to negative 0.02t plus pi over 4. du is just negative 0.2dt. So we don't have the negative 0 0.02, so we're working with 1 over negative 0 0.02 du is just our dt. So as we integrate both sides with respect to t, we get our position equals. And we know we don't exactly have our dt is equal to negative 1 over 0 0.02 times the initial coefficient of 160 tangent of our u du. These combine and we'll get 800, negative 800 that we can pull in front of the integral. 
And then we just have the integral of tangent. We'll follow this rule is natural log absolute value of secant of our u. And then plus the constant of integration. We'll call that b. And now remember a few properties of logarithms that might help us clean this up a bit. Secant is cosine of the inside to the negative one. But remember properties of logarithms, they bring exponents down as coefficients. So our expression is y equals positive 800 ln of cosine. plus our constant, and we recall that the initial height since it was launched from the ground was zero. So if we substitute that in, we'll be able to solve for what the constant of integration b is. We have zero equals 800 times ln of cosine of zero plus pi over four plus b. Now cosine of pi over four is square root of 2 over 2. And that's how it's most commonly known, but remember square root of 2 over 2 is the same as 1 over square root of 2. You can check by rationalizing the denominator. And the reason I want to list this here is it will help us because it's written as 2 to the negative 1 half. And due to natural log and the properties of exponents, I think that will clean up very nicely. So let's replace it with the more commonly or the less common one over square root of two or two to the negative one half power. Again, natural log takes exponents, brings them down as constant multiples. So we get zero equals negative 800 times one half is 400. Natural log of two plus B. So B has to be positive 400, natural log of two. This equation will give us the height at any time t. So we'll be done with this problem if we know what t value to plug into this height equation. Now the t value was determined by, we were looking at when the arrow was at the peak or when velocity was equal to zero. So we can set our original velocity equation equal to zero to find the right time period, and then plug that into our final equation for the height. So setting our original velocity equation equal to zero and solving for t, we get 3.92699 seconds. We'll plug this value of t into our equation to get our height. And we find after substituting into our calculator that the maximum height the arrow reaches is 277.26 feet.